Hi, I'm Jason Gore for ThatShelf.com and we're going to talk about watt stacks. Big shelf. So in August 1972, there was a remarkable concert in the watt section of Los Angeles um, uh, where Stax Records, the Memphis label, um, Isaac Hayes, uh, Booker T and the MGs, this incredible label, um, semi-associated with Atlantic, uh, very, very complicated story, and the story of Stax is actually quite remarkable, Art Bell, etc., um, did a concert in Watts. Now, Watts is an area, a predominantly African-American area, especially then, in um, Los Angeles that was the, um, for many uh, was, was uh, uh, within sort of popular media was absolutely denigrated as this, uh, the sign of riots and negativity um, for very justifiable reasons, but nonetheless it was thought of as the bad area of Los Angeles that one would avoid, but not worthy of celebration or not something on the international stage. And one thing that, that the, the, those behind um, Stax Records um, and um, some other very prominent um, uh, individuals decided to essentially take the um, festival motif, the rock festival motif that had been going on since the late 60s, starting with Likes of Monterey, um, and, and bring it to the area and actually present music to the community in an incredibly uplifting way, um, one that actually spoke to not only contemporary music, but some of the political issues there, um, things like the Rainbow Coalition that absolutely played um, an integral part with Jesse Jackson. Um, uh, the concert was um, considered a great success. Um, uh, some astonishing performances. A movie was made of it. And again, this is, if you think about it, Woodstock was 69, the movie came out 70, 71, this is 72. Um, this is very much uh, continuing where, where this sort of pop soul was becoming the, the established um, uh, popular music um, um, for, for many people. And this actually allowed a showcase of, of actually many generations of artists um, to come together on this, this massive stage and actually document it um, better than um, uh, had been done before. Again, specifically for an audience that was uh, drawn from and artists that were drawn from the African-American community. So, records did come out at the time. This is the original uh, soundtrack version. Um, Gatefold has all kinds of uh, excellent photos on the inside. Um, and some of the most uh, prominent people. We got Albert King, the incredible uh, blues musician, Isaac Hayes, um, who was just coming into the fore um, as not only a producer and songwriter at Stax, but also an individual performer. Staple singers... Uh, the, the astonishing Mavis Staples, um, uh, um, along with the rest of her family, including, of course, Pops. Um, Rufus Thomas, who himself, um, the sort of definitive Stax artist in many ways, songwriter, along with his daughter Irma, um, just helped define what the Stax sound actually was. Um, right from its earliest uh, moments and absolutely there. Eddie Floyd, um, uh, uh, Carla Thomas, <laughs> um, and the Soul Children. Um, just just a, a tremendous, tremendous uh, collection of artists that was uh, in the film, which is very much worth seeing, and the original soundtrack. There was a second version of the soundtrack called The Living Word, Oh, it's a little bit shiny here, but uh, mine's an actual um, semi, um, a, a version still in shrink. It's got the original uh, price of $1.69 on here. Um, Richard Pryor being one of the MCs. And this one has the Jesse Jackson introduction, um, which ended up getting sampled by Public Enemy years later, right from um, these soundtracks. Kim West and Rance Allen Group, again, some more prominent than others, but I really dig what actually shows up in the second um thing you have again richard Pryor doing some comedy bits david porter doing some bits um johnny taylor uh um the emotions uh so this is sort of a much deeper cut version than the sort of straight up regular soundtrack um and uh really really um um extraordinary sort of documentation of it now when we we've talked about on this um channel before when this bad boy came out, um, um, the incredible documentary, the Oscar-winning documentary, uh, just a year ago, um, slightly overshadowed by somebody being a prick. But nonetheless, um, the extraordinary, extraordinary Summer of Soul, this was a taste of that. And I've wanted, just like we did when we did the video for this, a sort of complete version of many of these um, 
uh, performances, just an ext a way to sort of have an audio documentary of everything that actually took place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they did it with Woodstock. I have the ridiculous Woodstock 38, 39 CD set, which is everything that played except for a couple things. We discussed that before. Summer of Soul, I'm still waiting on the, like, just give me everything that sort of took place in the last three weeks. It's going to be digital. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to get my 90 record vinyl box set, but it would be fantastic to actually get this taken care of. And Watt Stacks, given the fact that it's um, essentially the 51st year, um, there was hope that it would actually finally have a complete showcase of everything that was on stage there. Now, um, that was released. Uh, there's a digital version and an analog version. Uh, the CD set uh, includes everything, including some rehearsal and other sort of auxiliary things. And I'm such a completist, I would normally have bought the digital one, but I had to draw the line somewhere. I love this concert, and it's primarily the concert that I really wanted. Which brings us to this, which is a particularly silly um, um, uh, vinyl box set from Concord Records, or friends uh, at Concord Records. Obviously this is purchased by me, but there's a really tremendous label. And this is What Stacks the Complete Concert Quantity One. So let's open this up and see what I actually have inside on the vinyl set. So as I open up the box carefully, we have inside ah, on craft, part of the Concord name, this bad boy. So here is the limited edition celebrating 50 years since the iconic What Stacks event 10 LP set of the complete 72 LA Memorial Coliseum show, including 10 previously uh, unreleased tracks. Uh, features 68 page full color book with introduction by WhatsApp creator Al Bell and new essays by Rob Bowman. So Rob Bowman's nice Toronto boy, uh, teaches at York, I think he's still at York, uh, Grammy award winning um, uh, um, uh, academic uh, who did the the complete Stax Volt set, um, which uh, I mean, I could tell the story about this very briefly. I've mentioned it before, but essentially the complete Stax Volt um, set it's something that was recommended to me by, of all people, Dan Aykroyd. I was at a party with him randomly when I was in Kingston, Ontario. And uh, we were talking about music and I told him how much I love the bar case um, when it was used in Spies Like Us. And he's like, oh, you should go pick up this set. And at the time I'm like, okay, it's just a couple CD sets. It was this 10 CD set back then there were hundreds of dollars back when hundreds of dollars was even more exorbitant then. It was a poor starving student, but it took me years and years and years. I got the three sets with Rob Bowman doing the, um, uh, the commentary, the actually um, uh, liner notes for it. So here we have Rob Bowman again, um, and A. Scott Galloway, including performances by Isaac Hayes, Rufus Thomas, Albert King, Carla Thomas, William Bell, Barkays, Eddie Floyd, Kim Wesson, the Staples Singers, and more included in this massive... 10 LP set. So let us crack it open as carefully as we can and see what we have inside. So this is very exciting. Again, limited edition 10 LP set of the concert. The digital version includes the concert plus additional material that frankly, uh, I've made the economic decision that that additional material is something I'm going to listen to off the streaming or the files not actually owning the CD. This is called adulting. Um, inside we have just our regular ye old um, box set. And we have a nice hardcover book. Um, I am somebody that's the, um, the Jesse Jackson uh, portion that was um, sampled by among other people, <laughs> public enemy. Um, LA Coliseum show. Um, in the movie, it, it bounces from the LA Coliseum to actually show d uh, different elements within the uh, Watts community. Um, so it, it fundamentally was using Watts not only as a specific area of Los Angeles, but also to simply highlight the, the, the cultural impact of this part of West Coast um, black culture um, was having. Um, by a bunch of people coming from Memphis. Um, uh, it was a really interesting liaison between the artists um, uh, within LA and the stuff that was still taking place on what had historically been a much more um, 
uh, dominant African American culture that would obviously change over my lifetime. This this concert was two months uh, after I was born, for God's sake. Um, no nationality could go through what black people went through here and still survive like we do. All right then, where's somebody? Now I can say like my friend James Brown today, I can say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Pop Staples. Pop Staples, who um, the um, founder of the Staples Singers, somebody who was... Um, broadly political in the sense that he was obviously working with Martin Luther King and stuff like that, but was thought as this, you know, gregarious, amiable person. This was made overtly, um, um, right where the Black Liberation Movement and all the other elements were uh, happening at the same time. The fact that like, somebody like Pops was standing up on that stage and actually saying, quoting James Brown, um, uh, very interesting. Now, James Brown himself, a completely... F um, fascinating character in around 1972 that I think is when he started working with Richard Nixon he on the much more conservative side so yeah really uh, uh, fascinating and nuanced conversation to have about African American uh, celebrity in the early 70s some beautiful photographs here uh, Jesse Jackson up here um, with the power salute um, Isaac Hayes wearing his daishiki um, and Al Bell himself doing an introduction with the book Again, that was the first time I'm seeing this. Essays, try to do this without ripping it, that would be nice. Some wonderful photographs, lots and lots of text, giving context. As you can see, this is almost academic in its, um, uh, in its uh, scope, which is wonderful. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that shot <laughs> of Isaac Hayes just absolutely crushing it. Um, it's uh, practically still from the film. Um, and then, uh, oh, this is cool, an actual, um, reproduction of the original concert program, uh, back when that sort of thing was sold off at concerts, um, and, uh, that, so we have the full track list and lift every voice and sing, so they're damn right, to quote Isaac, damn right indeed. So right around when, um, uh, uh, Isaac Hayes's um, Soul albums were doing amazingly well. The Shaft theme um, was uh, dominating the pop charts. This was pretty phenomenal. And you can see the artwork there. Uh, if I get it without the glare, pretty fantastic. So inside here, ah, I see what it is. This is gonna be difficult to show, but each record clearly forms the Isaac Hayes damn right. So I think if you sort of put them together, as sort of a mosaic and uh, have them all laid out, you'll actually have the Isaac Hayes. So let's sort of go through here and look at what the records themselves look like. You can see they're all lettered. They're in plain paper, um, cardboard um, things, GHI, JK, M, N, O, P. Let's look for A, B, C. Here we are, here's A and B. So right here, um, Dale Warren and the Watts Tax 72 Orchestra, 1920, 19 minute and 20 second Salvation Symphony opens up track, uh, side one, track one. I love it. Um, Kim Weston doing the Star Spangled Banner, uh, Tommy Jaguette and Jack, uh, Jesse Jackson doing the opening things, then more Kim Weston, then Melvin Van Peebles um, also speaking. So again, it was this mix of uh, people speaking to the audience and musical performances interspersed. So the records themselves, you see I already got a hair on it. It's looking, um, it's okay. It's looking a little bit milky on the vinyl itself. I will obviously clean it and some surface uh, scuffs. Not surprising, actually quite considerable surface scuffs. Not surprising given the fact that it was shoved in this uh, cardboard sleeves. There is definitely some milkiness on there. I'm going to give it a, a clean and see how that stands out. But considering the set was a fortune, that is a little bit unfortunate. I actually can see some handprints directly on there. It's actually, I can actually see fingerprints. So that is uh, something to be on the lookout for. This is something that I purchased from somewhere where this one, this particular one might be coming back, going back and looking for one that is um, slightly more pristine. I'm going to do that obviously after cleaning it and seeing how it actually um, stands out. Okay, as I'm opening up some of the other ones, here's C and D. Um, there's some distress on the covers. Again, they look great, but I would have really liked if these had been packaged slightly better. And yeah, same sort of milkiness on here. Not super. This one actually has 
two pretty large scratches right on top of it again and looking very very dirty um, that is like deeply unfortunate about it i've been looking forward to this set for a long time this is very expensive um, so we will see about the quality control for this for such a limited edition premium set you would hope that the pressings were actually done a lot better than they are that cd we might as well go through and see if we see anything <laughs> i mean there's isaac hayes ef same thing here i always feel bad pulling it out here yeah i don't know if you can see that massive streaks right on the record there i don't know how well this is going to show up on camera but yeah all of these look they're filthy and they look milky so i'm hoping it's all surface level stuff um that it'll clean up i'll certainly give it the benefit of the doubt even though it probably shouldn't um but we'll see how this uh, all works out. I got everything all sort of mixed out here. They don't have to be in order, but we might as well do it in order. Here's G and H. Let's look for one that's pristine, shall we? I mean, we're doing this in real time. As I pull this out, same thing, same milkiness. Again, it's, it's almost like a sheen. I can actually see marks all the way through the pressing. And this also has some streaks on it very disappointing something deserving of absolute top line pressing and it's just this kind of thing is just so frustrated when you buy new records yep this one's as i almost drop it this actually has some schmutz on it same kind of thing lots of markings same milkiness no actual fingerprints on this one at least so here we are on ij and the same kind of issues that we're having. KL. Same. Identical. Yeah. So none of these absolutely look. I mean, you know what exactly. I know any of you who are collectors see this stuff and it's just pristine. Um, a, a mirror um, finish. This you can, you can absolutely uh, get a sense, I hope. I, I literally have no idea how it's showing up on camera, um, but that there's this sort of cloudiness sort of on, on the surface of these records, wherever it were, they were pressed. Uh, MN, same, same. Bunch of like sort of hatching almost there. Some, a pretty big scratch here. All of this might be surface. All of this might not be an issue. Bunch of dust here. This is why you always clean your records even if they're brand new, especially if they're in sleeves like this. OP, uh, I mean, more Jesse Jackson, Soul Children, uh, John Cassandra, Billy Eckstein. I mean, Billy Eckstein, <laughs> jazz giant. Uh, this one looks a little bit better than the others, except on the other side. Yep, same kind of marks. I don't know if you can see this, those little uh, sort of white pieces of paper here sort of coming off. Um, that's OP. Then we have QR. Uh, more Jesse Jackson, and this is the Isaac Hayes um, record, basically. There, some more cloudiness. Yeah, can you see that? A massive streak that's right across the bottom there. Again, forgive me uh, for trying to make this work, but none of these are clean, and this one has this, this sort of angled mark right on there. And then finally, ST. Um, give this a shot here. Yeah, so again, massive fingerprints right here. It's, you can actually, there. it's right here. I can actually see somebody's handprint basically on here. It's made this sort of oily pattern on the record. Um, lots and lots of scratches and marks on here. Um, filthy records more fingerprints on this side just just a disaster frankly so something we've been looking for for so much money spent on this so many has to drop it on the floor so much so much in the sleep um so much money spent um on producing this on actually celebrating it something deserving of the absolute top notch of a record label that frankly i expect a hell of a lot more um craft records um usually have uh, impeccable pressing. Um, and this is just, um, just on first look, just visually is a disaster. 
the fact that I spent this much money on it. For the people who are going to buy this and just throw it on a Crosley, who gives a shit? But for those of us that actually want this as a celebration of this um, incredible concert, this incredible um, uh, moment in music history, and to have this for basically as a foundational part of our collection, this is completely inexcusable. The quality control is absolutely downright appalling. And um, there we are in real time. Um, I'm so, so disappointed that they look like this. I'll obviously give them a clean and give them a listen, but I shouldn't require this much work just to get something that I've spent this much money on to be um, satisfactory. Very disappointed craft, and um, uh, I hope that this is this is sort of one-off and I was unlucky, but um, I'm certainly going to have to see about actually getting a replacement copy. The problem is the replacement copy might be from the same batch, then I'll get it and it'll be equally poor. So we will see what we're actually going to end up with this. But uh, yeah, there's my look at the Wattstacks Complete Concert Unboxing. Very, very disappointing for anyone who's a vinyl collector. Definitely um, buy it from somewhere where you know you're going to be able to refund it. Um, that is one of the challenges. I really like supporting independent records stores but when it comes to this something like this i came close to actually importing it um, from one of my local record stores and i decided i had to get it from somewhere where the return policy was sufficient that i wasn't feeling that i was dinging them um, it really sucks sometimes with vinyl uh, that you sort of are paying a premium and you believe that you're going to get a product that absolutely is top notch. Um, I'm not expecting crazy audio file stuff. It's fine that I've seen these sleeves, but it's just inexcusable how poor these records actually seem to um, look and um, we'll see how they actually behave. There we are. I wish I had uh, better news for those uh, who are actually interested in such a box set. I hope you uh, let me know in the comments how your copy is and um, um, we'll go from there. If, if and when I get a replacement, um, I'll do a follow-up video and we'll see how that one actually plays out compared to this one. For ThatShelf.com, I'm Jason Gorber. Thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on social media, and we will see you next video. All the best. Take care.